Look up. Look up. When you've done all you can, and all that's left to do is stand. Look up. Look up. It's time to face the unknown. I am right by your side. You won't ever have to stand alone. Don't be dismayed. Just look up. Look up When a heaven seems so far away Feels like the unrighteous prosper every day Look up Look up This world isn't all that there is I'm preparing a place where all who love me will live. Don't be dismayed. Just look up. Your redemption is coming. And it won't be too long. Don't be dismayed, just look up, look up. When people laugh at righteousness, they say you're strange. Nevertheless, look up, look up. See the salvation of the Lord. Remember, there comes a time when everyone receives their reward. Don't be dismayed, just look up. Your redemption. Just remember, remember the promises I made and be of good courage, be of good courage and look up, look up, my friends, don't be dismayed, just Look up. What a blessing. And Devel, thank you for, for those songs. Uh, that last song he sang, Look Up, is one of my favorites. Uh, that's what we all need to be doing, is looking up to God, looking up to Jesus. We have a lot ahead of us. We have storms ahead of us that few realize, maybe none of us realize, but uh, God is going to be with us in the midst of this crisis. So I want to welcome you to our opening night of a special seminar or series, whatever you want to call it, 
called What to Do When the Mark of the Beast is Enforced. I'm glad our speakers have all arrived. James, good to see you. I haven't uh, seen James in a while. Good friend. And there's just, I could mention names, but I'm glad all the speakers are here. They've had a little bit of difficulty getting here, but God has worked it all out. A lot of praying has gone into this weekend. A lot of preparation, planning, and our hope and our prayer is that this weekend will ripple out through technology to a lot of places all around this world. Uh, we're going to be talking about the big issues, the big issues that we're going to face, that the world is going to face, and we need to be on the right side so that we can be ready when Jesus comes. Does that sound good? So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open up to Second Peter. Second Peter, uh, I'm only one of, of the speakers this weekend, as you know. I'm the kickoff for the weekend, and my topic is, what is the mark of the beast? What is it? And then I'll also be giving sort of an overview of what's going to be happening uh, when the mark of the beast in, is enforced, and my conviction that we are getting very close to the, that time. And then I'll talk about what we need to be uh, doing and what we'll be facing. And the other speakers will fill in the details after what I've talked about tonight. So our opening text is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And I know we've had prayer, but I'd like to pray again. Can't pray too much, can you? And when this seminar is over, when this weekend is over, uh, we're going to spend some, some time in prayer because it's not enough just to talk about these things. We need to be praying. We need to be talking to Jesus. We want this to be very practical so that we learn a lot and that we're blessed and that the Holy Spirit is truly here and that it will ripple out to a lot of places. So let's, uh, let's just pray again. Dear Father, Heavenly Father, thank you for this group. There's a lot of people in this church and we we know that there are many people in different parts of the world that are watching this online. You have opened up these doors, technological doors that your word can ripple around the world. And we pray for your blessing this evening. Lord, please help me. You know, I'm, I'm but dust and I need your Holy Spirit and your power. And may Jesus be lifted up tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Are you ready? You're ready. Okay. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, talks about God's word, his sure word. And I'd like to just read a little bit of this verse. You can see some of it on the screen. Uh, Peter wrote this. He said, we have also a more, and what's that next word? Sure. sure. Word of prophecy. We have a more sure word. Uh, I grew up in California, and even the ground that I walked on wasn't sure. I've been on many, in many earthquakes, and it just seems these days that almost everything's up for grabs. Isn't that right? So many ideas, so many opinions, so many religions, so many philosophies, so many traditions. Everything is just in a state of flux, and uh, you know it's hard, to, it's hard to find something sure these days. But there's a lot of things that I'm sure of, absolutely. I know my name is Steve Wahlberg. I'm sure of that. I know that my wife's name is Kristen. I am positive of that. I know if my son is 15 years old, our son, and his name is Seth. No doubt in my mind. Uh, our little girl, Abby, Abigail, she's now 12, and I'm sure of that. And we have a dog named Puka. <laughs> And we have three cats and another dog named Eva. Uh, and when I go home, you know, those animals are going to be there. And there are things that I am absolutely positive about. There's just no question. And the Bible says that there's something else we can be sure of. And that is God's sure word of prophecy. Prophecies in his book. Uh, many of the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled in the past such as the prediction that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That's exactly what happened. There have been prophecies fulfilled in history. Uh, there are prophecies that are being fulfilled right now. And there are prophecies that are coming, that are coming. 
And they're sure. There's no doubt about it. They're going to happen. And one of those prophecies is the one that we're going to focus on this weekend, which is in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. And if you have your Bible, you can look in your Bible or you can read it on the screen. And we'll just read part of verse uh, 17. But if you've got it, you can see it. Revelation 13, verse 16 says, He causes, how many people? He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. No one will buy or sell, save he that had the mark. This is a prophecy in God's word, and this is part of the sure word of prophecy. This prophecy is going to happen. It is going to be fulfilled. And the organizers of this weekend believe that we are not far away from this prophecy happening right in front of our eyes. Uh, Something happened here at this pulpit about a month and a half ago that I've never seen ever happen. Uh, I've been going to this church here in Newport, Washington for about 11 years. And about a month and a half ago, one of the elders was up here and he was making announcements and all of a sudden there was a big crash. And what happened was, if you, those of you who are in front of that clock can turn around and see that big clock there on the wall, and what happened was, for some reason, that clock came crashing down. Uh, thankfully, no one was sitting directly under it. And anyway, the elder who was here on the platform, he uh, had his wits about him, and when the clock came crashing down, he said, it looks like we're out of time. And I thought, that's a great sermon illustration. (laughs) We are almost out of time. We're not quite out of time. Time hasn't come crashing down yet. But I'm convinced, and many people are convinced, that it won't be long until we are out of time. And the final prophecies in the Bible are going to be fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Now, when it comes to the mark of the beast, what is this mysterious mark anyway? Uh, There certainly are a lot of ideas. If you Google mark of the beast, you'll find a lot of websites and a lot of opinions and a lot of ideas that are just all around the world concerning the mark of the beast. A lot of it's very confusing. And I hope to clear up the confusion tonight and make things very, very clear. Mark of the beast, that's right. It's mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. We've seen two of those places right in front of us in Revelation 13, 16. Uh, There are six other places, but there is one place in the book of Revelation that actually gives us clues, very definite, clear clues as to what the mark of the beast actually is. And that section in Revelation is in Revelation chapter 14. So if you turn in your Bibles to Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, It's the section where there are three angels, three angels' messages that sound all over the world, giving uh, final messages before Jesus Christ returns. Revelation 14, chapter 6 through 12. Now, we're not going to read every line tonight. We just don't have time. But I want to draw your attention to a few very significant points. And one of them is part of the message of the first angel in Revelation 14, verse 7 at the end of the verse, says this. It says, Worship him that did what? That made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So right in the midst of the three angels' messages, the first angel's message, there is a call. There is a specific call to worship. Notice that word, worship. And who are we to worship? We are to worship not man, but God. And we are to worship the maker of all life. The one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it. There's a clarion call in the first angel's message to worship the maker of heaven and earth. Now, that call is then followed by a warning. 
in verse 9, 9 through 11, we have a warning from the third angel's message. And just a little bit here in verse 9, the Bible says the third angel followed them, followed the other two, saying with a loud voice, if any man, and what's that next word? Worship. Right, just like Revelation 14, 7 talks about worshiping the Creator, 14, 9 says don't worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Now, I just want to make a clear point that in uh, Revelation 14, we have two groups. Did you see that? One group worships the Creator, and the other group worships the beast and gets the mark. That's very clear right from the Bible. And then when you keep, you keep reading verses 9 and 10 and 11, there's a very, very solemn warning about what will happen to those who eventually get the mark of the beast. It's a very serious warning uh, about the wrath of God coming upon them, and they will definitely be in big trouble with the Lord. And then at the end of verse 11, it mentions the mark, whoever receives the mark of his name, and then verse 12 describes a group of people who don't get that mark. Verse 12 says, Here is the patience of what group? Of the saints, right? The saints of God don't get the mark of the beast. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So notice the, uh, you know, the revelation that God gives us here. We have two groups, one group worships the creator and one group worships the beast and gets the mark. And the, and the group that is on the good side, that worships the creator, they also keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. And I like the fact that at the very end of the third angel's message, right before the period, at the end of verse 12, is the name Jesus. I've been impressed with that that Jesus, he's got the last word. He's the Lord of all. The book of Revelation actually came from him. Revelation 1 verse 1 says, uh, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Revelation reveals him, exalts him, is centered in him. He's got the last word. And he loves everybody, doesn't he? He loves us all. He loves every single human being on planet Earth. And what you're looking at over here, and we don't have time right now to look up, there's a lot of verses in the New Testament like John 1 verse 3, John 1 verse 10, Ephesians 3 verse 9, Colossians 1 verse 16. There are many verses in the New Testament that tell us that Jesus is more than just a man, that he is actually God, our creator in human form, who gave his life on the cross. So when the Bible says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it, it's really a call to worship Jesus, to worship Christ as our, as our maker. And what you see on the screen here and what you see in your Bibles, this is, this is the truth. This is something we can be sure of, right? In God's sure word of prophecy. Uh, sometimes these days, you know, it's very difficult to really know what truth is. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you know, a lot of arguments sound good. There's all kinds of different opinions, and sometimes it's very confusing. Where is the truth? Uh, I had a very interesting experience that happened to me just a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I put my mother, actually, she's deceased, and I d decided to put her China on Craigslist. And I got an email in a short time from a man who said his name was Daniel Smith. And he said that he, was, he wanted uh, the china. Uh, he offered to give me an extra $50. So I was asking 100 not a huge amount. And he said, uh, I'll give you an extra 50 to hold it for me. And then I'm going to send you a cashier's check. And then when you get it, you, know, you cash it, deposit it, and then, uh, and then I'll tell you what to do from there. Now, I had a very funny feeling about this from the very beginning, but I played along with it and, and didn't let him let, let on that I was very suspicious of him. So the cashier's check came in the mail. I was offering $100 or asking $100. Uh, 
Uh, and I thought he would send me 150, and I actually got a check for $1,450. Cashier's check, and I've got the check right here. <laughs> Cashier's check. So I promptly took it to the bank, did not deposit it, showed it to uh, one of my friends there, one of the tellers, and she, did, she just looked at the paper and she said, this is not a real cashier's check. And she did a, a couple of other things. And see, she knew what a real cashier's check looks like. You know, bank tellers are trained. It's a different paper, there's different things on it. So we knew that this was a scam. So anyway, uh, Daniel, if that's his real name, was expecting me to deposit this and then take out the 100 and the 50 and then another 70 for my time and mail him back uh, or wire him back $1,280. <laughs> that was his plan. And, and when I, you know, I played along with this and when I finally uh, sh explained that I wasn't expecting to send you any money, I was expecting you to come and buy what I've got and then you give me the money and I give you the china. And so finally we went back and forth and he said, he said, well, what are you going to do with my $1,280 that you're supposed to send me back? And at this point, I finally, oh, and prior to that, he wrote me and he said, he texted me and he said, I don't lie. The overpayment is meant to cover the cost of shipping the item to me alongside my other properties. Trust me. Everything is cool. Please kindly follow the instructions I will send to your email. Thank you. Well, I wrote him back. And I said, uh, Daniel, I finally, I finally let loose. But I was, uh, the Holy Spirit monitored me. <laughs> the Lord's brought me a long way. I won't tell you what some of the things I used to write to people like this. But God has been working on my heart. So I wrote to him, I said, uh, Daniel, there is no 1280. You said, trust me, and I don't lie. But you do lie. The bank easily found that your cashier's check was fraudulent. Your plan was for, was for me to return to you $1,280 and scam me. I said, do you know what God says in, in the Bible about liars? What's going to happen to liars? It says all liars, all liars, the Bible says, will finally be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, verse 8, unless they repent. Daniel, I've known you were lying from the beginning. I'm a minister. You are a scam artist. I feel very sorry for you. You are hurting people, and you are willing to hurt me and my family by stealing from us. I wish I could help you. God will forgive you if you repent. I appeal to you. If you don't repent, your future will be horrible. I appeal to you in love. Is making money worth losing your soul? Don't sell yourself so cheaply. God loves you still. Jesus suffered and died for your sins. Crime isn't worth it. Turn around before it's too late. I will pray for you. And that's what I sent him. Uh, and that was the last time I heard from Daniel Smith. But our family did pray for him. We did pray for him because he's a lost soul who's breaking the law of God. The commandment that says, do not steal, he's violating. Now, how do, you know, how do we know the truth about the mark of the beast in the midst of all these ideas and people who say, trust me? And maybe they are sincere, but how do we know? Listen to this. The lady at the bank, she knew that that cashier's check was fraudulent because she knew what an original cashier's check looks like. And we need to know what God says in his word. What is the truth about this matter? Now, if you look there on the screen... It's very clear that we need to worship the Creator, keep the commandments, and follow Jesus. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's exactly what the Bible says. And how do we know what's true and what's a lie when it comes to the mark of the beast? We know by looking at the original. 
When we look at the real thing, then we'll know what's true and what's not true. When you look at the Ten Commandments, as the third angel talks about keeping the commandments, there is only one of the Ten Commandments that talks about the maker of heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. How many did I say? How many commandments? One. And that, is the o- and that one commandment is the only commandment that says, remember, don't forget. It's commandment number four that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it tells us that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. So in the midst of all the confusion and all the websites and all the ideas about the mark of the beast, we have to look at the facts. We have to look at the sure word of prophecy. We have to look at the Ten Commandments. We have to look at the original. Just like the lady at the bank looked at that cashier's check and knew it was fraudulent because she knew what a real cashier's check looks like. The fourth commandment is the only one about the Creator, and it's the only one that says, remember. And when you put the pieces together, from the first angel and the third angel and verse 12, the picture becomes very, very clear. So that we don't have to be confused, even if people say, trust me, I don't lie. Well, they may not be lying consciously, but they, they are mistaken. Now, the Bible says back in Revelation 14 that the mark of the beast is the mark of the who? Who? The mark of the, starts with a B, (laughs) beast, that's right. So in order to know about the mark, we need to know about the beast, right? Because the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. Pretty simple, but a lot of people miss that. So who is the beast? Anyway, uh, I'm not going to take all the time that I could take in talking about this tonight, But I have written a little book, which Whitehorse Media has available, and this is called The Antichrist Identified, and this book goes into a wealth of historical and biblical information identifying who the beast is of prophecy. Martin Luther, who founded the Lutheran Church, believed it. John Calvin, a Reformed Presbyterian in Europe, he believed it. John Wesley, who founded the... Methodist Church, he believed it. Matthew Henry, the most famous uh, author of a Bible commentary set, he believed this. The translators of the original King James Bible in 1611, they believed it, and they put it right in the introduction to King James when that first first came out. Uh, They all believed unanimously that the beast of prophecy that the beast is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church system. Now, I always clarify this when I say this in front of a crowd, that 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 is not an implication against the people within the Catholic Church, because there are a lot of godly, honest, sincere people who would never uh, send you a $1,450 cashier's check. They would never do that, And, and I know that, and there's a lot of them all around the world. But the fact is that when you look at the system of Catholicism, the system fulfills every single point of biblical prophecy. Now, it's no secret that today, the majority of Christian churches have their church services on Sunday. That's, uh, it's, you know, it's common knowledge. Uh, in, In our community, there are plenty of Sunday churches filled with many, many people that are very sincere and are doing their best to follow God and Jesus based upon the information that they have. But they need to learn some new things and compare those things with the Ten Commandments. Here's a statement from a Catholic catechism. I've got this catechism right here. If you want to get a copy of a Catholic catechism, you can order this one from Whitehorse Media. 
we actually have this one, and we don't have it because we promote all the teachings that are in the catechism, but especially because of page 50. And it's on the screen there, very significant. It says, question, what day is the Sabbath day? Uh, answer, Saturday is, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And there's a, a lot of quotations similar to this that come right from the Catholic Church saying, we are the ones, if you go back historically, that made the change and that commands people to keep the first day of the week. Now, here's another amazing historical statement uh, from Cardinal Gibbons in a letter dated November 11, 1895. He acknowledged, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act is a what? It's a mark, right, of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. So basically what the Roman church says is, yes, it's true that the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. We all know that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And the Catholic church says, we changed that day from the seventh to the first day of the week because we are the true church. And that change is a mark of our authority in religious matters. That's what they say. That's what they, that's what they claim. Now, is that a legitimate claim or is that a bogus claim like a $1,450 cashier's check on a piece of paper? Is that the real thing or isn't it? Uh, White Horse Media now has a new book just, just coming out right now. I actually just got copies today in the mail. And it's called The Truth About the Sabbath, Proof That the Seventh Day, Saturday, is Still God's Holy Day. Uh, and the evidence is overwhelming. When you look at history, when you look at prophecy, when you look at the Ten Commandments, when you look at the teachings of Jesus, and this book goes into a wealth of information proving that, that the original seventh day is still God's Sabbath, and it's the Roman church that changed the day, and they claim it as a mark of their authority. Now, we already read tonight in Revelation 13, verse 16, that one of these days, the mark of the beast is going to be enforced by law, right? So that nobody can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Nobody has the mark of the beast now, but one of these days, it's going to be enforced by law according to the sure word of prophecy. That's what the Bible says. Now, is this possible? How is this possible? How could this ever happen in America that has a constitution that forbids our government to enforce a religious observance? How could something that, like that happen in America or around, of the, or around the world? Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of something called climate change? Have you heard of climate change? If you're watching the news these days, uh, surely you've heard of this over and over and over again. This is just a s screen capture from YouTube videos, and there's a lot of them out there. Uh, there are protests going on around the world about climate change. There are musicians singing about it. YouTube videos are coming out. United Nations is talking about it. NASA is talking about it. The list goes on and on and on. And what's basically happening is this that disasters are on the rise. This world is full of problems. Isn't that right? Like Nivelle sang a little bit ago, we need to look up because this world is falling apart. And as we look around and check out the news and you know, read the headlines, it's very clear that we are seeing hurricanes, storms, fires, floods, famines, locusts in East Africa. Uh, things are just, you know, getting worse and worse and worse. We can see this. And many of these disasters are connected, at least by the media, to climate change. They're saying this is climate change. This is what's happening. This is what we're seeing because the climate is changing. And the basic idea is this, that humanity is overusing fossil fuels coal, oil, and natural gas. And this overuse of fossil fuels is creating what's called greenhouse gases. 
that are going up into the sky, that are trapping heat and warming the planet and contributing to all of these disasters. That's the basic idea. So the climate change movement is trying to appeal to government leaders and to pressure them to act now to pass legislation to limit the use of fossil fuels so that, we can, so that the planet can be saved. That's the uh, scenario that's being presented. <clears throat> this is another book that just came off the press, available from Whitehorse Media. Uh, we'll have some tomorrow night, called Climate Change, Is It the End of the World? And this book goes into all the different issues, and here's a big issue. It's obvious, well-known, no secret, that one of the biggest advocates for action on climate change is Pope Francis. And it's also no secret that one of the most significant documents that is respected by the climate change movement worldwide is uh, Pope Francis' encyclical called Laudato Si, that deals with taking care of the environment. And it's also a fact that a big part of his encyclical and part of his solution that he recommends to the whole world to help solve global warming and the problem of climate change and all the disasters that are happening on Earth, he says in section 237 of his encyclical, which came out in 2015, this is what he said. He said, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. And uh, this document has been translated in languages around the world. It's being read by politicians. It's part of the global climate change movement where Francis strongly says inside of his encyclical that keeping Sunday is part of the solution to the problem of the environment and global climate change. I don't know if, you, uh, if any, of you, any of you saw this article that came out in The Guardian, and the title is Slow Sunday, the Simple Solution to Global Warming. Uh, using Sunday as a day of rest and renewal would be good for our personal health as well as the health of the planet. Not long ago, Sunday used to be a day of rest, a day of spiritual renewal, a day for families to come together. But we've changed Sunday from a day of rest to a day of shopping, flying, and driving. However, in the context of excessive carbon dioxide emissions that are warming the planet into the atmosphere, which are bringing catastrophic upheavals, so there's the carbon dioxide issue, the fossil fuel issue, going up, warming the planet, and resulting in all these catastrophes, we can and we should restore Sunday to a day for Gaia, a day for the earth. I don't know if you've heard this, but uh, in Rome and in different places in Italy, uh, they've decided because of all the pollution and the environmental problems that they would turn Sunday into an eco-Sunday or eco-Sunday. Uh, Rome's first Echo Sunday will see mopeds and motorcycles banned from city streets. And they're doing this to try to fight smog and try to help the environment. Now what's happening is there are, there's a growing chorus of pro-Sunday pro arguments. And it's not just to help the planet, but it's for morality, families, health, society. There's a whole host of articles that are coming out. And let me just go through these quickly. This is from the Associated Press. These are all re fairly recent. Keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. This is a, called the Parliament, which is a, uh, an organization in Europe. Sunday work is a danger to our health and our safety. This is ABC News. German court enforces day of rest. This is Fox News. Let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. This is a publication dealing with uh, one of the many news clippings dealing with what's happening in North Dakota recently. North Dakota Senate rejects blue law repeal. People are trying to get rid of the blue laws, but they, North Dakota rejected that because citizens should use that time to go to worship. So the North Dakota Senate approved blue laws. This is from CNN. Uh, this was a, a woman, Sylvia, I believe it was Brown, no, Sylvia Allen, who made a statement that uh, we should be debating a bill requiring people to go to church, a church of their choice, on Sunday. 
And here's another article. This is a picture of a, uh, a journal called First Things, which is a journal of religion and public life. And the article here, uh, 4 to 19 last year, Bring Back the Blue Laws. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, are you familiar with the term chatter? I'm not talking about people just chattering on, but I'm talking about uh, United States government agencies monitoring the chatter of terrorists. Have you heard about that? Uh, most of us have. This is an article that talked about, this was in 2003, not long after September 11, 2001, where the State Department issued a worldwide caution Thursday warning that the newly released tape of Osama bin Laden and a recent increase in intelligence chatter might indicate an imminent terrorist attack. And then this article talks about what chatter is. It's different intelligence agencies monitoring this chatter. And it says when the spies that work for these intelligence agencies notice volume spikes on several networks and compare them with the content of recent communication, intercepts, satellite observations, and information passed to spies on the ground, patterns emerge. So intelligence organizations, are they've got their ear to the ground and they're listening for the chatter from different places of what the terrorists might be up to. And so then they plan accordingly. And I want to tell you that it is true. I know, and as we've been planning for this weekend, I've, I've gotten, you know, I've read some statements where there are some people that say that we're not on the edge of Sunday laws. I mean, it's true. It's not being debated right now in Congress. The big issue that's been debated in Congress is whether Trump should remain in office, if you're aware of that. But, uh, we're, you know, we're not, we're not right now facing a national issue where Sunday is being debated in a major way and Sunday laws are staring us in the face. We're not seeing that, are we? No, we're not. But I, I want to tell you what we are seeing. We're seeing, if we're, if we're intelligent, remember, it's intelligent organizations that are monitoring, monitoring the chatter. And, and I've got articles in my files, many, many more than what I've showed you. I could spend, you know, an hour going through all these different articles. And I'm here to tell you without any question that there is a lot of chatter going on right now in many different places. ABC, CBS, Associated Press, CNN, and especially in the midst of Pope Francis's book or encyclical on the environment that is promoting Sunday. So the chatter is here, right? Sunday is not being enforced by law nationally or globally, but the chatter is here. See what I mean? Now, what would have to happen for the chatter to turn into a reality? Would that have to take 10 years, 20 years, 50 years for something like that to happen? No. All that needs to happen is a swift sequence of big disasters. And things can change overnight. Things can change very fast. We've seen massive wildfires in Australia that are being blamed on climate change. Earthquakes in Puerto Rico, threatening volcano in the Philippines, locusts in East Africa, the, the uh, coronavirus, are you watching that? Uh, out of China, that is multiplying rapidly. Rapidly. We are seeing a lot of these things, and I can promise you that these things are going to get worse in the days ahead. And it won't take much. It won't take much for a sequence, a rapid sequence of major catastrophic disasters like what we're seeing right now happening around the world. And we could very, very quickly wake up one day and find ourselves in a different world. It could happen very fast we could find ourselves in the midst of a global crisis 
with a global false solution. And Satan casts a wide net. He'll appeal to, this is good for society. This is good for morality. This is good for families. This is good for your own personal health. And as disasters get worse, they're gonna, people are finally going to start saying, God is involved in this. And this is what we need to please God. We need to come back to Sunday for the benefit of our spiritual lives and for the benefit of the planet. And I tell you, this can happen very fast. Just like the towers came down when the sky was blue. Out of a clear blue sky on a Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, the towers came down and we woke up and it was a different world. Right? Are you following me? These things can happen very, very fast. And the purpose of this weekend is to wake us up to the fact that the chatter is here and God's sure word of prophecy is in his book. And this sure word of prophecy is going to come to pass right in front of our eyes. And when it does, we're going to find ourselves suddenly, unexpectedly, in the middle of earth's final crisis that has been predicted in the Bible for approximately 2,000 years. Now, in the rest of the time that I've got, before Nivelle comes and sings again, uh, I want to share with you just a quick overview of what, what then. And the other speakers through this weekend are going to be filling in the details and talking about what's, what do we do when that final crisis hits. And again, it can happen it can happen very fast. What then? Well, number one is what's going to happen is God's church, the people who know about these issues, the church is going to be shaken. And there's going to be different groups within the church. There are going to be those in the church who are ready for this crisis. And they're going to stand for God. There are others who are not going to be ready for this unexpected storm. And they're not going to be ready, and uh, a large group of them are going to join the devil, yield to the pressure, and take the mark of the beast. But there's another group that sometimes we don't realize, but that group is there. There's going to be another group that are not quite ready yet, but they're sti they still can get ready during that final crisis, but it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be some people that they're not quite ready, but they can still get ready. And Tim Saxton will talk about that more tomorrow. But it's going to be harder, harder to do it. God's church is going to be divided between two groups. We have a little book on this from White Horse Media called God's Remnant Church Divided. This will also be available tomorrow night. Those who are ready and who want to get ready are going to go through a period of deep, deep, deep humility and repentance for anything and everything they can think of. And they're going to be drawing close to Jesus. They're going to be praying. They're going to be trusting the promises of the Word of God for their lives. They're going to be trusting the sure word of prophecy. And the promises that are found in the Bible us during that time. Now open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Those who humble themselves, those who confess their sins, those who trust Jesus as their Savior, those who don't give up, those who don't yield to the devil's temptations. The devil's going to be telling a lot of people, there's no point in trying. You're not ready, you're lost. So just give up. Don't listen to that lie. I've heard that voice in my head many times. The devil has said, you're too much of a sinner, Steve Wahlberg. Just give up. And I've, God has helped me to look the devil in the face, so to speak, and say, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to hold on to Jesus no matter what. Amen. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out, 
may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ. Now notice the sequence. Sins are blotted out and then the refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. Do we know what that refreshing is? It's called the latter rain. The former rain fell on the day of Pentecost. The latter rain is coming at the very end upon the people of God who have been humbling themselves and who are prepared to receive the Spirit of the Lord. Their sins are going to be blotted out. And they're going to have a clean slate. And with a total clean slate, when the power of God is going to come into them, it's going to refresh them and empower them like never before. And there's going to be out of the midst of this confusion and storm and crisis and shaking and division, there's going to be a body that's going to rise up like an army. Like an unstoppable army. And they are going to go out and they are going to give the third angel's message with a loud voice. As it says in Revelation 14.9, the third angel followed them and said with a loud voice. And the, these messages are going to be preached through people who are going to warn the world about the mark of the beast. They're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. They're going to talk about the Sabbath. They're going to talk about Jesus and what he did on the cross. I know this is a rather bloody picture up there I've got on the screen, but I tell you, the cross was not pretty. It was not pretty. And when our creator became a man, he went through everything that, he, that the devil could throw at him. Everything the devil could throw at him. And I'm convinced that when the final time of the loud cry, when the army rises, and then they go out to the world, their hearts are going to have such love for the lost. Like the Holy Spirit gave me in my response to Daniel, I know you're a scammer, but God loves you. Jesus died for you. There's still hope for you if you will turn your life over to him and repent. And the loud cry is the last call of the maker of all life appealing to his world during the mark of the beast crisis for people to come to Jesus, to come to the cross, to confess their sins, to give their lives to him, to receive the refreshing, the Holy Spirit, and then to stand as a commandment keeper in the last days. That is what is going to be happening. Love's final call. And I tell you, when that time comes and the third angel goes out, and, and not only are we talking to each other, but we're talking to the world out there, and we're showing the world the truth of Jesus in the Bible. And, and, I, and you know, I should stress too that, as I mentioned, Jesus loves everybody. He loves the Republicans. He loves Democrats. He loves President Trump. He loves Nancy Pelosi. He loves those who are involved in Wicca, those who are pagans, those who are atheists. His love is above politics. He loves everybody. And we've got to have that love inside of our hearts for a lost world. And when we really get that right and start preaching during the latter rain, I tell you, the devil's going to throw everything at us. And we're going to enter a time of uh, signs and wonders and miracles like we've never seen ever before. 2 Thessalonians 2, nine says talks about the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. There will be satanic miracles telling people to keep Sunday. There will be evil spirits impersonating dead people saying, keep Sunday. Satan himself will impersonate Jesus and he will say, keep Sunday. And the battle will be on between both sides. And those who take a stand for the Sabbath and for the truth of the three angels' messages, many of them are going to be brought before the courts. And we're going to have to stand before judges and juries and, and the prosecution. And we need to build our case. And our case 
is this. God has a law that is above all laws. It's the Ten Commandments that he wrote with his own finger on stone. He tells us the seventh day is his Sabbath because it points to the maker of heaven and earth, who is Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross. So we're going to build our case from the law of God. We're going to talk about religious freedom. Sunday is a violation. Sunday enforcement is a violation of our Constitution, forbidding government to enforce religion. And we're going to appeal to people to find forgiveness and grace and love and mercy through Jesus Christ. That's our argument. The Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, religious freedom, and the cross. And if we stand before the courts through the power of the Holy Spirit and give a clear, humble, straightforward, simple message in love to those who we are talking to, I tell you, the Holy Spirit's going to use that powerfully. The earth is going to be lightened with its glory. And people are going to have to make, make decisions. Uh, many of these people are going to be thrown in jail. I don't know if I'm going to be one of them. I don't know, but it's in the Lord's hands. And then there'll be a period of time, a final period of choice where everybody will make a choice. The whole world will decide, one by one, are we going to go along with the beast and get the mark? Or are we going to go along with Jesus and keep his Sabbath? Which one are we going to do? The seal of God or the mark of the beast? And when that time comes, as the word goes out, there's going to be a whole lot of Catholics. There's going to be a whole lot of Protestants. There's going to be a whole lot of people in many walks of life who are going to hear the call. And they're going to take a stand. And they're going to join the people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They're going to be gathered out from all around the world. And we've got to be thinking not just about, you know, working with, with us within our church, but we need to be thinking about reaching the people out there with the love of God, with Jesus Christ, and his message from the Bible. We need to get ready for that. We need to prepare for the loud cry. And when God's final number is made up, one group gets the mark and one group gets the seal, and this group is fully formed, then the door above will close. Finally, like the door of Noah's Ark, closed. And when it closed, you're either in or you're out. It's too late. Revelation 22 verse 11 describes the closing of that door and everybody's going to be on one side. Or... And then the seven last plagues will fall. In Revelation 16, they will fall on those who get the mark. And they're going to be very real plagues. And when that time comes, there's going to be a whole lot of people that wished that they would have made the right choice. And those of us that are on God's side will go through a final time of trouble where our faith will be tried to the utmost, will be tested in every single way. Satan's going to throw it all at us. But by the grace of God, we're going to stay with the Lord, and we're going to say, God, I'm trusting your holy word. I'm trusting your sure word. Bring me through this crisis. Bring me through, and it's going to happen. God will bring a people all the way through until they finally look up. As Nivelle sang his song, look up. They're going to look up, and they're going to see coming in the clouds with power and great glory, Jesus Christ coming down to rescue his people who have chosen to trust him, to love him, and to take a stand during earth's final crisis against all the devils of this world to stand for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let me finish our meeting tonight by telling you a story about my dog. <laughs> I used to tell stories about my kids. Uh, but this time it's about my dog. Puka, that's my dog's name. You can see our dog. She'll be there tonight when we go home. She's such a wonderful dog. I love this dog. Puka, she's kind of a border collie, uh, shepherd mix. And anyway, as you, can, as you know, uh, many dogs, they just love to go for walks with their owners. <laughs> and that's Puka. 
I mean, anytime I get my, my pants on, she runs over to sniff my pants to see if these are pants where I'm going to go to church. And if she does, she walks away. And if she sees like I've got, you know, sweatpants on or jeans, she knows maybe he's going to go for a walk. And she follows me all over the house. And she looks at me wherever I go. And uh, she, this, this, I just took this picture because we have a lot of snow outside in our backyard. And, and anyway, he, here's Puka. And, and what happens is we go out of the house and we walk down the driveway to a, to a tee. And typically, I go to the right, and I wander around in the neighborhood, and Puka walks with me. She's done this for years. But for some reason, something strange has been happening in the last month or so. She stopped going out with me. And she would go run down the driveway, and she'd watch me when I get to the end of the driveway. And when I made a right and walked, she'd go back to the house. And I could not figure this out. Puka, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you walking with me? Well, anyway, I was talking to Tim Saxton about this and talked to my, my wife about this. And, you know, as we talked about this, finally we, we came up with a possible answer. And that is that one time we went down to the right and around the corner and a dog ran out, kind of a vicious dog, and uh, attacked Puka. And we figured out that maybe Puka is just spooked and she's scared, and she doesn't want to go that way anymore with me. So I thought, well, I'm going to test that theory. And so then I went out, and you can see, there she is, you know, she's just waiting. What, what are you going to do, Steve? I did, instead of going to the right, which I normally did, I'm going to go to the left, because the road goes both ways and winds around in the country. And so sure enough, sure enough, when I made the choice to go to the left, she bolted right after me. And there you can see her. She's going down the road. And I thought about that, and I finally figured out what was happening. She doesn't want to go to the right because she thinks it's dangerous. But she goes to the left because she thinks it's safe. And I tell that story because it's a simple way of making a point. And the point is this. All of us, and eventually the whole world, is going, we are going to be faced with two paths. There's a path going one direction, and there's a path going in another direction. And I thought about this, and I've concluded that the whole issue of the mark of the beast is God's way of bringing the two paths before everyone. The one path is the path of sin. It's dangerous. It's actually fatal. When the mark of the beast comes, if we get the mark of the beast, which means we've chosen to go against the law of God and to break the law of God, and to have a mark in our souls that we are commandment breakers. That's a fatal road to follow. But the other path is the path of safety. It's a path of trusting Jesus Christ with your whole heart. It's a path of surrendering your life to him and to his love, believing that he loves you and he knows what's best for you. And it's a path of choosing to be a commandment keeper. And that's just not nine, but that's all ten. Which is fulfilled in the principle of love. Love for God and love for your neighbor as yourself. Whatever political party you choose to identify with. It's the love of God. And that is the path of safety. I'll say it again. Trusting Jesus believing in him as your savior and by his Holy Spirit power choosing to keep the Ten Commandments because that law is the law of God's government. It's the law of eternity. It's the law of happiness and joy and peace. And 
he wants us to make that choice to keep all ten, including the seventh day Sabbath, which will be a huge issue at the end of time. Dear Father in heaven, Father, we come to you in the name of 
Jesus, your, your son, who you worked with to make this planet. Lord, I know that, uh, that you love all of us much more than I love my dog. You love us so much. And we pray, Lord, that you will prepare us for the storm. We're not facing the mark right now, but things can happen very quickly. We, we can hear the chatter. We know that the storm is gathering, and it could happen in a very short time when it's, when it's time. Lord, prepare us to stand during that crisis, to have our sins all blotted out, to receive the refreshing, the latter rain, and then to give the third angel's message with a loud voice, with deep love and compassion to a lost world that doesn't understand these issues. So we can call them to you one last time before the door closes and Jesus comes. Lord, use this weekend to instruct your people around the world. Bless all the other speakers and the singers and may your Holy Spirit's deep movings be felt among us. We thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you for protecting us and bless this weekend, we pray. And now during a holy time as we go home and go to sleep during the Sabbath hours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.